Welcome one to another edition of Playthrough, and on this bonus episode is Chippendale Rescue Rangers, the Japanese version. Just like I did with DuckTales, since I played Chippendale so many years ago, I figured why not revisit it, but this time play the Japanese version, so it's a very, very tiny bit different. Mainly the fact that the story is in Japanese, and outside of that I don't really notice too many other differences while playing, but it's still an absolute all-time classic NES title, so it's always fun to go back and replay. While there's discussions, of course, of what was the best NES license-based game, you know, based on cartoons or movies, comics, and whatnot, but usually, when that discussion happens, the Disney Capcom games are always right there near the very top of the absolute best. It just comes down to which ones you end up liking better, and while I'm definitely more into DuckTales than I am Chippendale, Chippendale can be argued that it's overall the better game. It has more levels overall to it, and of course the co-op option makes it one of the best two-player games available on the NES. One of the things that made the game so fun was the whole box mechanic. You're unable to jump on enemies like a classic platformer, use your cane like in DuckTales, but what you can do is pick up boxes and throw them at your enemies, as well as actually kind of curl up inside the box and hide, and if enemies run into it, they end up getting hurt. The game even has a level selection screen, so you can go to a couple of different choices. Not many, there's only two times in the game where you kind of get the pick between multiple levels, but I will be going through and completing every one of the stages during this run. The bosses in the game are always fun as well to fight. You have a red ball that you'll use in every one of the boss encounters, and you use that to take them out while dodging the projectiles and throwing it up at them. If you time it correctly, you can re-catch it, whether you throw it straight up against the ceiling, or if you throw it against the left and right walls, you can catch it as it comes back, as we take out the first boss after watching out for the electricity that it fires out from both the left and right sides of it. After completing the Zone Zero, or Level 1, we meet Fat Cat, who uh, has kidnapped Gadget, the mouse companion of Chippendale, and our goal is to save her, and after doing so, there's a few more levels even after that. Then we get to see the map screen for the first time and go to the second level of the game, and here we start the lettered level, so we go to Zone A to start us off. As we work our way up this giant tree watching out for the bugs and the flying ninja squirrels, we make it to the top and face off against the second boss of the game, this owl. The owl flies across the top, dropping down the feathers, which are pretty easy to dodge, and then comes down so that we can throw the ball either left or right at him, and then he flies back up and repeats the process. Bosses sometimes take a few more hits than others, and after completing every level, you get a little bonus game where you can pick up boxes and find hidden items underneath. The items that we're able to find in the game are the stars, where you collect the normal stars, 10 of them gives you an extra life. If you find a glowing, flashing star, that gives you instantly a 1-up. There's the flowers, which kind of work like coins, and when you get 50 of them, you end up getting a 1-up. There's the jar that has the letter P on it. I guess it's like a magic power potion. Either way, picking it up allows you to pick up heavier objects. And there's also then the acorns that you can find, which will refill your health. Next level we're doing is level C, though don't worry, I will be going to letter B after completing this stage before moving on. The kangaroos are a bit of an annoyance because of the way they throw out the projectiles with the tennis rackets. I think they're supposed to be, I guess, like tennis balls, but they're yellow, so not quite sure on the colors there. Uh, but they are pretty hard to dodge sometimes when doing certain jumps, and the kangaroos themselves take multiple hits of defeat. One other item that you can find is finding your pal Zipper, who will join you for a bit, giving you invulnerability, as well as taking out any enemy that he sees for that period of time. A couple of the levels in the game don't end with a boss encounter. Level C is one of those levels, so we don't face off with a boss, we just go right to the bonus game after reaching the end of it, and then we get back to the map screen after some bit of story. Though we would end up getting this story multiple times after completing Zone A, we end up getting that. So we'll end up seeing the same bit of dialogue once we complete Zone B, since it's technically optional. You only have to complete one of these two potential stages. 
I've always liked this level. Uh, it has that restaurant-esque feel to it, but it can be a bit difficult a little bit farther in. You have these bear enemies that end up showing up and launch multiple green balls in your direction, and then you have the sinks that you have to turn off as they are pouring water from up above you as well as going below. It's kind of weird how this all works, but you're able to turn off the faucets and be able to get by without being hurt. Now, you have to be very cautious when it comes to the giant cooking pots, because if you fall in to them, you are instantly dead and have to restart the area. So be very careful, of course, when jumping to the knobs on top above each of these pots. Here is that P potion. I'm not sure exactly what it's supposed to be, but either way, it allows us to pick up the heavier objects like the apples and be able to use them as weapons instead of just using, like, the crates and the like. Here we go with the next boss, which is this alien spacecraft that flies back and forth. It's random where it ends up coming out at. You just have to kind of be ready and get ready to launch the ball in its direction in order to damage it. After a couple of hits, it goes down and we move on to the next zone. Next up is Zone D, which is in a kind of toy store mixed with like a Christmas theme because there's wrapped up presents as well as the continual stuffed animal that's just kind of staring out at you from its packaging and spread out all over the place. The Jack in the Boxes as well as the Spinning Top guys, and these guys are a bit annoying but you can kind of take a nice little path to get around most of them pretty easily. In the next section, you have these rabbits introduced that have these rugs. They kind of like pick up the ground literally and shake it at you and then cause like a run in the rug to come all the way at you. It's very unique, kind of creative overall uh, enemy to deal with. The next segment right after that though, you have to deal with a bunch of the giant balls kind of rolling at you, but you can turn on and off the switches if you want to. There's only one that I recommend turning completely off and that was that very last one. Here we outrun a bunch of falling blocks or whatever they're supposed to be and then make it to the far right side with more of these springy guys. When we make it to the very top here, run along the top, you can do a couple of nice time jumps and get right over the bouncing boxes that are all around here. The boss for this section is this robot, which always confused me because the attack spot where you have to hit him is basically his nipples. It's very strange, but that's where the lights are located, and it's a little bit sometimes hard to actually hit them because of the eyesight, like it's a little bit below the max height of your jump. Still a pretty easy fight overall, but always weirded me out, just, just a little bit. Now here is our second choice in the game. We get to pick between Zone E and Zone F. And like I said, I'm going to be doing all the levels here, so I'm going to go to Zone E first, which is one that I probably do the least. Whenever I decide to replay Chippendale, uh, which I like to do you know, maybe once a year or something like that since the last time I did my playthrough of it, and before I decide to do this one, I usually don't do Zone E. I usually do Zone F and then go to G and then the rest of the levels. One thing that's cool though is this level has two unique items to it. First up is the boat that you actually get to ride across this giant uh, fountain. And then right after that you get a hammer that you're able to pick up and smash rocks with it. And you need to do that in order to hammer your way through. And the hammer can also be used to defeat some enemies throughout the level. There's only a handful of enemies you'll get to use it on before you end up making it to the door. But it's still kind of cool to bash a few things with this hammer. In this segment, be careful not to get pulled down with the quicksand that will push you towards the antlion-like enemy that's in the middle there. There's a one up from this box right located after that, and then we make it to the boss fight, which is this big fish that just kind of floats around, and I guess it's supposed to be technically underwater and swimming, but overall it's just kind of weird looking with the blue background. Very easy to take out. He has a couple of electricity bolts he will throw out, but for the most part that's pretty easy to dodge and usually only gets one off before I'm able to defeat it. Once that is taken care of, we go back to the map screen and move on to the next stage, level F. Now this one starts off with a couple of giant balls rolling down, be careful not to get hit by them or fall down into the pits below. It can sometimes be easy in the game to mistime a jump and end up jumping and hitting your head and falling down where you didn't want to, so always be careful when you decide to make your jumps. 
Watch out for the giant chicken enemies that can punch the different boxes when you're trying to get close to them. I like a couple of the enemies in the game that are able to do that, like those and the rhinos. Now here, this area is a bit tricky because if you jump too quickly or you pick up like this crate, for example, you can sometimes go too far up and because of that, you're unable to scroll the screen back down and you may end up uh, going into the abyss and lose a life. So be cautious, of course, while climbing up on through this area. But when you reach the top, that's it. There's no boss for the stage. And now we get to move on to Zone G, which is the final one of the levels for the first map of the game. Zone G has an awesome casino theme to it, making it another one of my personal favorites. I love slot machines and any kind of gambling type thing. Like I said, creativity of level design was one of the many reasons why this game is so beloved by many, including myself. It also has a really good soundtrack, maybe not quite as epic or amazing as DuckTales, but still a very, very good soundtrack that went along with everything as well. Watch out for the football playing rhino guys, they will bust through quite a lot. I actually get more hit by the like robot bee enemy than I end up getting hit by the rhino guys. The antlion like type guys at the top, so usually I take the easier path, or at least in my opinion the easier path on the bottom part, and then go on through to the next room. Now in here, watch out for this guy, and then decide to make the big jump after he knocks the boxes out of the way. There's a few of those robot bugs throughout this room that will charge you when they get in the same line of sight as you, so you have to be careful of those guys. Pick up a bunch of flowers if you want. Now, if you want an extra life, you can build up the blocks there in order to get to that box up there, but all it has is an extra life, which we've gotten a few so far. The boss is this awesome cat in a, like, tuxedo that's throwing coins at us. Very easy to hit, but what makes the level a little bit tougher to deal with him is the fact you do have some spikes on the floor itself, which I usually, if I'm going to die in that boss, it's usually because of those, not because of the boss itself, because I'm paying more attention to him and his projectiles than I am at the actual floor of the stage. After completing it, we have saved Gadget, but Fat Cat has gotten away, so we take a rocket all the way to another area, pretty much all the way into space, but then we come back down to Earth, and we have three more levels to go before we get to face off with Fat Cat at the end of the third one. Level H is the obligatory sewer level, not usually a fan favorite of anybody. In fact, I very rarely find anybody who likes sewer levels, though I know they exist. I'm sure somebody may even see this video and be like, I love sewer levels, they're my absolute favorite, though I, I never really met a person that has always been like, yeah, and platformers, my favorite type of level is sewer. It's also a bit difficult to kind of go through this area with the crab enemies as well as more of those, like, diving, flying, squirrel ninja guys which will glide on down, and because of just how big they end up being, it can be difficult to kind of get around them. In the next segment, you have these clone alien dudes that will change into whichever one of the Chippendale Rescue Rangers you're currently playing as, as well as more of these bears. But the bears at the very top, when they use their projectiles, most of them just end up going off screen, so they're very easy to dodge. There is no boss for this section, so once you reach the end, pass one more of the clone alien dudes. Level H or Zone H is complete, and we move on to Zone I. As we enter the second to last level, watch out for the bug enemies. These guys are probably my least favorite, and this level is one of the harder ones because you have both the pelican-like guys as well as those bugs. And the reason why the bugs are annoying is they're pretty big, and they do kind of a double jump when they end up appearing. You also have giant fans to worry about throughout the level, and with the pelicans, when you throw a box at them, they just eat it and throw it back out at you. If you quickly throw another one at them when you do decide to attack them, you can sometimes be able to actually hit them and get rid of them, but it's a little bit difficult. The timing is pretty uh, precise. Like right here, throw that next one right at them and you're able to take them out. I always found it funny that Monterey Jack, of course, appears. He only appears in two levels in the game. I guess they just wanted to make sure he was included in some way, shape, or form. All he does is make a hole for you to kind of go through, 
but uh, he only appears in those two levels, this one and the first level of the game. So I'm not sure if there was plans for them to do more with him, or it was just like, oh, look, he's here, make sure that you know he's here. Either way, at the end of that area, after using Zipper to help us out, we take on the next boss, which is this giant, like, centipede-like guy who breaks apart when you end up hitting him. As long as you know kind of like where to stand when he breaks apart, it's very easy to dodge his attacks and be able to keep delivering hits with the ball. Once he goes down, we're now moving on to the final level of the game. The final level of the game starts us off with some conveyor belts. There's a bunch of those like buzzing mechanical bee-like guys, as well as you have these football playing rhinos. It's a bit tough to jump over them just because you are using the conveyor belts as well. There's a bit of health with these acorns near the end of the area though, so if you do end up getting hit, thankfully you can replenish some of your health. The other main two types of enemies you're going to be dealing with a lot are the weasels that shoot the plungers out at you, and then like the alligator gecko-like guys who end up throwing their hats out at you. Be careful of the axes swinging back and forth on this conveyor belt, wait for them to kind of go to the opposite side, before attempting to jump over them. Right after that, the gator throwing mafia guys will be there, so be careful, either kind of like crouch inside the box or run past them quickly like I do here on this left side and head up to the very top of the stage. Here you're going to have to use boxes to hit the switches in order to stop the axes from going up and down. There's plenty of boxes thankfully to hit the switches. The weasel guys take multiple hits which is a bit annoying so make sure you have a box at your disposal and use it to hit this guy even though I always, I always seem to get hit by him no matter what I do. And you're right near though the boss after you get past that conveyor belt. And here we go with the final boss of the game, Fat Cat. All Fat Cat does is move his cigar back and forth and flick ash in your direction. As long as you kind of stand where I am, you usually can dodge all the ash very easily, no matter which side of the room the cigar is on. And, like, just take a moment to appreciate, not only do we have such a great, great NES title, but the final boss is a Fat Cat in a suit, using a cigar as a weapon. Just the fact that a cartoon or a video game that's like, you know, aimed towards a younger audience would have a boss of any kind that uses a cigar or smokes a cigar is something you would not see nowadays. So it's something I very much appreciate more so now just because it's something you wouldn't see. But then you have the brief ending of text and all, and there you go. That is Chippendale Rescue Rangers on the NES, the Japanese version. And with that, it's going to wrap up this episode of Play It Through. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider giving it a thumbs up or commenting down below. If you enjoyed this playthrough, be sure to check out the one I recently did for Ninja Gaiden on the Atari Lynx, or for more Japanese Disney Capcom games, I also recently did DuckTales on the Famicom. I of course need to thank all the members of my Patreon as well. Without your guys' support, I wouldn't be able to keep doing what I'm doing. So if you enjoy the videos on this channel, maybe you want to help out, click the little Patreon button for all the details. Speaking of thanks, though, I need to thank you guys for watching this video, and of course, I hope you enjoy.